as I may have hinted at earlier during the offering, this has been a week of interruptions and our message is no different. I had fully prepared and planned to preach a message on gratitude today, um, getting ready for Thanksgiving. It's a message that's viable. It's a message that's important. It's a message we'll probably share next week, but God kind of changed the direction in the middle of the week. In light of all that we've been studying with this series that we've entitled Stranger Things, where we've been talking about the supernatural, talking about the fact that we live in a world at war, and there are powers and principalities and heavenly places that are set against us, but yet as Christians, we can have the victory. I felt it imperative to extend that series one more week to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Before we go there, I've got a quick video that recaps where we've been in the past few weeks. This is a modern day warrior. So, you know, when I am not looking in the mirror, this is who I think I am. And then I look in the mirror and there's a different reality. But maybe, praise God, I can be that in the spirit, right? Each of us can, right? Each of us in the spirit can be this. It says Ephesians 6.10, finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He does have them. We've talked about it. We've discerned it. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Jesus gave you authority to tread, stomp, walk on, be a ruler over all the powers of the enemy. Why aren't we using our authority? Why aren't we using this God-given authority that the Lord has given us to have victory in our lives. You know why, I'll tell you. All you note takers, this here it comes, here you go. Sin makes cowards of men. Sadly, not everyone is going to a better place. Do you get that? See, sometimes we lie at funerals, even pastors do it from time to time. At funerals, we like to say things like, their suffering is over, they're in a better place now. We say that maybe to appease the family, but for the unbeliever, that is absolutely not true. Their suffering is just starting to begin. That's why it's an imperative that we speak the truth while we still have the opportunity to do so. We're often worried about things that don't really matter and we're in the midst of a war and people are dying around us. Mark 9, 29, and he told them, this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Strongholds don't come down easily. That's why the Bible calls them strongholds. They have a strong hold on your life. But we've abandoned, and forgive me for my part in not preaching this message enough, that we need to spend more time in prayer and fasting. A a, a man brought a, a friend of his that was blind and came to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, can you do that hand thing, right? You do that hand thing where you lay your hand on him and then boom, he opens his eyes and he's healed. What did Jesus do? He spit in some mud. <laughs> and he took the mud spit, gathered it together. Can you imagine? Took that mud, put it on the person's eyeballs, boom, healed. Amen? Unpredictable. Can you imagine being that guy saying, Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you spitting in mud right now? You're going to rub it on that guy's eyes? That guy can't even see what's coming right now, right? Can you imagine? (laughs) What are you doing, Jesus? This is ridiculous. Like, come on, I'm not comfortable with this. Like, what are you doing, God? But why did Jesus do it in an unpredictable way? The man was thinking, okay, he's going to lay hands on him. It's the hand thing that does it. Why Why did Jesus change it up? Why did he do that? He didn't want him to worship the system. He didn't want him to worship the system. He wanted to do something beyond what his brain could really fathom and understand. He thought the hand is what healed him. No, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've made this case that we were born into a world at war. We have a real enemy, the devil, Lucifer, Satan himself, who's trying to take us out. We're to put on the armor of God and fight principalities and powers in heavenly places called angels and demons. We made the case that heaven and hell are real, that spiritual warfare is real. And last week, uh, Pastor Adam did a great job of introducing us to the person of the Holy Spirit. 
He actually mentioned that this is a topic that we could probably take many, many weeks on. And in fact, we did back in 2009. If you'd like to get a full doctrine on the power and person of the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you to go check out our archives. We have six messages that we did at that time along that vein. But today, I want to build on what Adam started last week when he talked about the person of the Holy Spirit and really talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and how essential that is for our lives today. Father, we thank you and praise you for where we've been. We're confronted with the realities that were presented that we truly are in a world that's at war. We see glimpses of it around us every day. We see the carnage around us of the people who are beat up, worn out, tired out because of this battle. And Lord, we wanna be part of the solution. We wanna be one of those who engage in this battle of epic proportions for our own generation. We look forward to seeing the conclusion of the story when you come back from heaven to earth and bring all things into perfect order the way that they were meant to be. So Lord, we ask you to use us to do our part. Empower us by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place to touch us, to change us, to mold us, to make us. And Father, we pray that we would leave this place in power and might and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to see many lives transformed as a result. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So today, I'm going to talk about some of the positions that different people hold regarding the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, typically you talk about the person of the Holy Spirit and it doesn't ruffle all that many feathers, but when you start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and how it manifests sometimes in ways that we're not comfortable with, then people get all weirded out. Come on, Jesus, right? So today maybe we could bring some balance to that. We could bring some understanding to it. We could talk about the different positions that people have and come to the conclusion that God is alive, that he is not dead, that he still walks in power, might, and anointing. In Jesus' name, is anybody excited? Amen, amen, amen. All right. Five of you are. The rest of you are like, oh, no, what is he going to do? Oh, gosh, it's going to be terrible. No. Two primary camps. One camp is called the cessationists. What cessationists generally believe is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased once the last apostle passed away after Jesus was here on earth. The opposing camp, if you were to go to the other end of the extreme, would probably be a full-on Pentecostal church. I mean, you know, the ones with characters. You got Hallelujah Dave. You got Tambourine Tammy. You got, none of y'all been a part of that church? Come on, Jesus, right? Yeah. Like five of you have on that side too. Okay, this mess is going to go over really well. Um, you know, so there's two ends of the spectrum. You got the cessationists, and then you got the full-on, you know, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I, I might be a little bit of critical of both of them today, if I were honest, as we dive into Scripture. I think there's some things we could learn from both of them, and there's some things that we could certainly apply in our life. Um, I'm honestly, personally, somewhere in the middle. I did get saved in a charismatic church, man. I loved every minute of it. It was exciting. Um, but there were some abuses that I witnessed at the same time that I'd love to bring some balance to and decency and order to in regard to our message today. But I would tell you from the very beginning, I would reiterate what I hinted at just a moment ago, we don't serve a God who you can put in a box. We serve a God who is alive, who is powerful, who is mighty, and if all that we have said is true, if we live in a world at war, if we have a real spiritual enemy, if angels and demons are real, if powers and principalities are real, if spiritual warfare is real, then we need the fullness of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be present in our lives if we're to combat that kind of an enemy. Can I get an amen? So if we believe that all of this to be true, then why in the world would God leave us without weapons to properly engage in this spiritual battle? That's kind of the premise that I want to begin on. First, and, or First Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 and 14 really articulate some great things. That's going to be the primary focus of our study today as we begin to build on this, as we begin to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1, says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. I love this opening because God is telling us from the very beginning, 
there's some weird stuff I'm about to tell you, but I'm telling it to you because I want you to understand. I want you to discern it. I want you to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I want not only to inform you of these things, but I believe that what we will be sharing today will transform your very life if you allow God to work at you in the areas that we're speaking. He goes on in a very similar sense where Adam left off last week in Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. Disciples are followers of Jesus Christ. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Again, the Bible's goal is not only to inform, but transform. Many people don't understand or have misunderstandings about the person and power of the Holy Spirit, much less the gifts of the Spirit. Many Christians, sadly, don't even exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Have you met a few of those, right? Have you ever been one of those? Be honest, come on, right? So we all need the fruits of the Spirit in our life. We all need the gifts of the Spirit in our life, both natural and supernatural. And if these verses are true, it says that the Bible wants to inform us more about that. I mentioned some of the debates about the gifts ceasing or not ceasing earlier. The other half of the debate is if there is one infilling of the Holy Spirit or if there are two. So we're gonna talk about that a bit today, but I think when it gets to some of these issues, I wanna make sure that we major on the majors and we minor on the minors, right? So whether or not you frankly believe that there are one infilling or two infillings, we all know some Christians that walk in power and some that don't walk in power, and frankly, I wanna walk in the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? Amen? So we'll discuss those nuances just a little bit here, though, too. When does one receive the Holy Spirit? If you go back to the verse that we read just a little bit ago, it says that no one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So that means for one to be saved means they need to have the Holy Spirit in their life, right? So when you get saved, you receive the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make general sense to you? Some of you are still confused. You're like, okay, yes, go back. When you get saved, guess what? The Holy Spirit takes residence in your heart and in your mind. Does that mean you know everything? Does that mean you walk in the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit yet? By no means. We just saw in scripture that there were disciples that didn't understand the things that we're gonna talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. They had no understanding of those things yet. And then Paul ends up laying hands on them and they receive an impartation of the Holy Spirit and then miracle kind of stuff begins to happen. So we all need to grow in this life. That's part of the reason we go to church, right? That's why we go to Bible studies. That's why we read God's word so that we can grow in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of who he is that we might ultimately fall in love with him all the more. So let's read on. Why am I making this case? Acts 19, 3. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And he said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance or unto salvation, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul lays hands on them and the Holy Spirit comes on them and they begin to speak in tongues and begin to prophesy. And they were 12 men in all. So what we need to understand is that sometimes God does some different kinds of things, right? And and he does some things when people lay hands on others in the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, where sometimes manifestations that we don't completely understand end up taking place, but there should always be this overriding factor of decency and order. So we say here at Journey Church, you are free to worship God during our musical portions of it. You're free to dance around. You're free to walk around. You're free to come up to the front. You're free to go kneel down by the cross. You're free to go take communion. You don't have to be stuck in your seats. Worship God how you feel led with one or two simple rules. You're not doing anything to draw attention to yourself or be a distraction to others. Because one of the things that you'll find is whenever the Holy Spirit manifests, even in supernatural ways, it always points people to Jesus, not towards ourselves. So if you're there to just make a scene about yourself, that's not biblical. That's not of the Lord. If you're trying to draw attention to you rather than point people to him, then that is not of the Lord. Does that make sense to you today? 
So many Pentecostals, in my opinion, go too far in one area. So I want to pick on the Pentecostals for just a moment. Um, they would say that the evidence of a person being saved or the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit would be that a person speaks in tongues. I think they take it too far because I certainly know a lot of Bible believing Christians who don't speak in tongues. And in fact, I will share with you in just a moment that tongues is one of many gifts of the Holy Spirit that he might impart unto us. So I'll be critical of the cessationists as well in different points along the message. But one of the areas where I think there is some abuse is in the area where someone says that the filling, the, that you are saved or that the gift of the Holy Spirit is that someone speaks in tongues, I would say that it is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and I will certainly make a case for that right here in Scripture. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 4, it says, now there are a variety of gifts. Did it say there is a gift called speaking in tongues, or did it just say that there are a variety of gifts, right? But the same Spirit. And there's a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So when he empowers us with these things, it is given for the common good. For one, it is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. So one gift of the Spirit is the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one in the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one in the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So he says there's all these variety of gifts, both natural and supernatural, that he wants to impart into our lives. There's not just one gift, there are many gifts, and the church needs to be able to operate in them if we are to combat powers and principalities and heavenly places in our generation. If you want to see victory, we need to see these things manifested corporately and individually in the life of the church. Can someone give me an amen? Yes. So this set of verses makes it very clear that tongues, for those who have trouble with it, is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is, and maybe we've been led astray in the past by others who didn't believe the same because we've seen it abused too many times. Is there abuse in every one of these areas? Yes, there is. Shame on those who do that, right? But at the same time, does that mean that they're not real? By no means, right? So do we throw the baby out with the bathwater because we've seen too many people with purple hair on TV? Come on, Jesus, right? No, it can be done with decency and in order. But tongues also at the same time are not the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There are many other evidences as were just articulated, right? So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit enters into your life and you're filled with the Holy Spirit. There are many Bible-believing saved people who um, would say that the gifts have ceased but exhibit tons of fruits of the Spirit, which is a byproduct of their salvation. So at the same time, I've seen a whole lot of Spirit-filled Christians who are some of the nastiest people you'd ever meet. Anybody witness? Bear a witness, right? So in both directions, there are abuses to the ones that are the legalistic cessationist camp, also to the ones that are the Pentecostal camp. Again, we don't want to major on the minors. Here's what I would say if we get back to my premise. If all that we have been learning is true, why would the gift cease? How would we combat powers and principalities in heavenly places? How would we fight this supernatural enemy? I ask you to study that during the course of the week. Learn about it if you're examining this. Would we not need the fullness of the gifts of the Spirit to be able to war against this supernatural enemy that we face? 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, 
it will pass away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, when perfection comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. So this is a set of verses that many cessationists would use that I would take issue with where they would say that the gifts of the Spirit are no longer in operation because the perfect came when the last apostle died, the Bible was set into canon, and there was no longer any need for these particular gifts anymore would be the case that they would make. I would contend with that, that the perfect comes when Jesus Christ returns this second time, right, to make all perfect come because there's verses in there that say, we see dimly like within a mirror right now, right now. It says, in the later days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, right? Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will prophesy. It goes on and it talks about a day and age that we're starting to bear witness to where the gifts are beginning to increase in powerful and mighty and decent and orderly ways, but we're getting glimpses of it. We get glimpses of seeing people get healed. Not everybody that comes up. In Jesus' day, man, somebody would come up and every single sick person in the place would get healed in one shot, right? I long for that day to return again before the coming of the Lord, right? So I believe that the perfect comes when Jesus returns to fulfill all things, right? It makes complete sense. We live in the middle of it. The chapter's not completed. It is not done yet. It is when he returns. Can I get an amen? If this is not true, then why would God write in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, avoid those that have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. Avoid such people. There are whole groups of people that would say, along the lines of what that says, oh, the word is true, the word is this, the word is that, but deny the power of God. He specifically tells us in Scripture to be weary and be cautious of that. So one of my contentions again, why can't we be an absolutely balanced group of people who love God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and live them out with decency and order in a way that does not bring division and is seasoned in love? That's a mouthful. I'm going to repeat it. Why can't we be a balanced group of people who love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, believe in the gifts of the Spirit, live them out with decency and order in a way that does not bring division, but is seasoned with love. I believe we can. We don't have to be fruits and nuts to worship Jesus and be charismatic, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm not Hallelujah Dave, right? Hallelujah Dave was a guy at our first church. If you've been around here any length of time, the worship service would start and Hallelujah Dave would go right up to the front. Hallelujah Jesus, hallelujah, right? You know, hallelujah. I'm not Will, where's Will? I don't know, he was here a little bit earlier. Will's very expressive. I kind of starred in the movie, White Men Can't Dance. I mean, you don't want me getting up here and dancing. So. I might be super happy and on fire for Jesus on the inside, but it has trouble manifesting on the outside, you know? And if it did, you probably wouldn't want to see it because it would look really goofy, you know? So we all sit at different ends of the spectrum as it comes to the way that we express it outwardly, right? But man, can we not be decent and balanced and full of the Holy Spirit and walk in power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in love? Can I get an amen? I believe we can, come on Jesus. Here's some further evidences that kind of convince me. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, one is one of those big ones. Or wait, I gotta go back. I think I skipped some stuff here. We're not there yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess the gift of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret tongues? No. But then he goes on to say this, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. 
and I will show you yet even a more excellent way. Why would God tell you to earnestly desire something that you cannot have? That's one of the big problems that I have with cessationist theology. Why would God tell you, and he will reiterate it again when I get to chapter 14 in just a moment, why would he tell you to earnestly desire something you cannot have? He tells us instead to long for them, to earnestly desire them, to ask him for them. At the same time, though, he also says there is a more excellent way. What is that more excellent way? In love. The time for Christians to keep fighting over these stupid non-issues should be dead by now, right? I mean, the devil uses that to create disunity over these things. Let me be very clear from the beginning. God meant one thing in his word. He's not, the Bible's not something that's flexible, it doesn't change, but in our fallenness and in our sinfulness and in our own humanity, we at times draw different conclusions about some certain sections of the Bible. Does that make sense with you? But then sadly, we go and we beat each other up about those differences that we say rather than expressing unity. So we'll get in a topic like this and we'll go on Facebook and we'll go all out and like stab each other over something like that online. What kind of witness is that to the people who are apart from Jesus? He says, they shall know us by our love for one another. Those kinds of debates shouldn't be taking place online or anywhere else in any kind of a visible sense, especially if they're single, you know, seasoned with anger rather than seasoned with love. We can respect some of the different positions as long as we major on the majors. Jesus Christ died on the third day. He was born of a Virgin Mary. He who dies for the remission of our sins. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ, right? If we can focus on those things, then there could be great unity in the body of Christ and amazing things could happen. It says this, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then he goes on to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is the way that we're called to live as believers in Jesus Christ, to live out the fruits of the Spirit as evidence that God is at work in our lives. And at the same time, he gave all these if statements about the powerful things that could be at work within you if you only desire them. If you long for them, if you put them into practice, God will use them to not only transform you, but transform the lives of many others as a result. Here's my final evidence that we could both love and believe and be balanced in the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 says, pursue love. And again, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. For the one who speaks in tongues is not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries of the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Again, there's a great debate with cessations. Oh, they spoke in tongues in the church and they didn't interpret it so they're not being biblical. Da -da -da -da. Come on, Jesus. Would we stop, you know, fiddling over stupid stuff? I mean, yes, it should be done decency and order. If you actually read on, he gives you an order of service where people speak in tongues and other people interpret it. And he says, Paul says, in addition to Jesus saying, Jesus saying, I earnestly desire that you would desire these things. And Paul saying, I wish all of you would speak in tongues. So why do we let the devil divide us over that issue? Could it be that there's great power in doing just that? So he's dead set against trying to allow people to do that. And he wants to make it this mysterious thing that's all crazy and freaky and divide people over. Could it be? Is he not a liar? Is he not the father of all lies? I mean, I read the Bible like a kid, man. Why do we got to add to a bunch of stuff to it? Didn't it just say that? Earnestly desire these things. Go for them. Live them out, but do so in love. 
do so in love and do so in decency and order and honor God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. Live out the fruits of the Spirit in your life. So here's how we want to conclude today. We're going to sing a couple more songs together. We've got time for it. Then we're going to go out there and we're going to eat chili together, praise God. Or if we run out, we'll eat hot dogs together, whatever it might take. But we pray you'll stay and hang out for that. We're not going to have an official, official dismissal at the end of the two songs. So if you want to bask in God's presence for a short bit longer, you are more than welcome.